<laughs> so I, I press record. Um, but yeah, yeah, you look Bye, great. <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, first of all, thank you for agreeing to talk to me today. Um, I have done a fair amount of um, research on yourself and, and Food Tank, and, and I think it's it's pretty amazing what you're able to achieve. I don't know how you do it with the amount of people that, that are involved, because um, usually there's an organisation that just challenges one area, but as a Food Tank, I suppose you're, you, you cover so many. And the first, the first I, I've just watched recently the TED Talk, that you did and it was talking mm -hmm. about you know women's um uh, position in or if that's the right word in in farming and you know how they, they're the stewards of of, of the land and all. it's very inspirational what you said and absolutely right as well um so um and i, I wasn't really i hadn't really thought that that's what we would talk about but i would like to if we have time sure. um to uh, to cover those to cover those um, areas. So, so, but first of all, thank you, thank you for agreeing to to talk to me. No, it's um, my pleasure. Um, the, the the main uh, area that I'm covering at the moment is um, farmers' uh, position in all of this noise. Um, and with the film that I've I've created and the album um, broadly being about just challenging your views on on whether you should or shouldn't eat meat. Um, vocalizing that to people that are friends and family a lot of them talk about the um where where farmers you know livestock farmers in particular um where they fit in all of this mm -hmm. um and and how they're going to cope if all of a sudden everyone stops eating eating meat um i mean in your experience um at food tank um and your thoughts and i i did listen to a podcast as well with I wrote his name down here, Lassie Brund. Lassie Brun, uh huh. Lassie Brun, yeah, and he was he was talking about um, the importance of um, livestock farmers in a small scale, and it wasn't them that were really the problem. It was the big factory farm um, sure. farms that, that that were the were the issue. It, can you could you flesh that that kind of out a little bit for me and, and your your sure. thoughts on it? Sure. From my experience, and I, I told you this before we began talking that, you know, I started out my career right after in graduate school and, and, and right after looking at the growth of factory farming, industrial animal operations, CAFOs is what we call them in the United States um, around the globe and how it, particularly in Asia and Latin America and now sub-Saharan Africa, uh, they are following the example of countries like the United States or England and, and in parts of the UK, where, you know, this method of crowding animals together um, um, and, and, and breeding them very fast, right, mm -hmm. you know, ha having chickens that can't really stand up because their, their breasts are too big and, and, and you know, creating um, a, uh, a situation, you know, I, I, that, that is very unhealthy. It's not just unhealthy and uh, for for the animals, it can be unhealthy for humans because it can help perpetuate the spread of zoonotic diseases. Zoonotic diseases spread from animals to humans, right. um, like you know uh, we saw a few years ago uh, with you know avian flu and and mm -hmm. SARS, not the current um, form yeah. of SARS right now, of course. Um, and they, you know, the, what really concerns me mostly about factory farms is the impact that they have on communities and farmers. Often farmers get caught in a, farmers and ranchers get caught in a vicious cycle where they're taking, you know, they they invest a lot of, of time and money into these animal operations. Um, they have to take out loans um, and, right. and they become part of sort of a cog in the wheel rather than being, you know, independent uh, operators, which I think is why a lot of people you know, once were attracted to, to farming and especially animal farming because they could, you know, be independent yeah. and and what this does is it creates a situation where there's a lot of pollution farmers that have a hard time getting rid of manure they have to buy animal feed from a particular company they have to sell to a particular company at a particular price it's a situation that that makes them you know sort of surfs on their own land rather mm. than you know the that independence that i think a lot of farmers crave and it creates a lot of pollution in communities it it creates um these are not the greatest places to live if you've been to you know Greeley, Colorado, where there are lots of of feedlots for cattle, it's 
it's a, a place that's unpleasant. Right. Often um, factory farms are placed in in marginalized communities of, of black and brown folks. Often it's black and brown folks who are, you know, work at them um, and the processing plants that, you know, um, uh, um, slaughter the animals and, and break them down for us to eat, make them look very sanitized in, in grocery stores. And so the, the, the problems with factory farming are immense and now global and they had, um, a particularly a destructive impact on on the Amazon um, mm. uh, that you know it's not just uh, cutting down trees to to raise cattle it's building slaughterhouses and processing plants that's also having an you know, impact on the Cerrado the grasslands there so there's just these widespread impacts and I haven't even talked about the inputs that go into factory farming there's a lot of water there's a lot of um, agrochemicals to grow soy and maize or corn there's um, uh, antibiotics that are mm -hmm. that are often needed again these animals get sick um there's transport of animals and so it's it's a it's a sort of um the, a system that only works as long as fossil fuel is cheap right? right and and now we're seeing with what's happening with the the russian aggression against ukraine that oil prices and fuel prices are going up so i don't know if that I, you know it's hard to predict what will happen but meat prices Will certainly go up and now when meat prices go up it usually affects the poorest consumers uh, mm -hmm. uh first and most and so i think I'll, I'll, you know we're looking at an, the next year and then the year after that where like folks are going to have a hard time you know uh, uh eating and in making sure that they have protein in their diets um so the, the, you know i i think what lasa and 50 by 40 the organization mm -hmm. that he runs um, are trying to do is create awareness about reducing meat consumption, yeah, um, yeah. particularly trying to find ways to refine the kind of meat we eat, eat less of it, maybe mm. don't eat it every day for every meal. Sorry, Scott, I have to blow my nose. I apologize. <laughs> That's fine. So maybe not eating meat at every meal, but um, you know, eating meat a couple of times a week, figuring out what, you know, where the farmers and ranchers in your area who are trying to um, raise responsibly produce meat. They it might not be organic. It might not be entirely grass fed, but they care about the animals and they, they care about their local economies. I think, you know, that kind of rethinking mm. of how we eat meat can really change our food systems and, and have that transformation. And you, you asked this question that I haven't answered yet, where, where farmers fit into this equation. And, you know, I, I don't think, you know, overnight or over the next 50 years, right. people are going to stop eating meat. I think we'll be eating different kinds of meat. I think there are novel proteins um, like culture, cultured and cultivated meat that are on the horizon. But I think, you know, farmers, especially in the global south, will always raise, you know, some sort of livestock. And what we need is a just transition to help farmers go from, you know, being part of that big factory farm in infrastructure that doesn't do a lot for them. They're not making a ton of money, but they're paying a lot of money to grow yeah. these these animals um, to get them into a situation where they, you know, they're growing, they're they're raising fewer animals. So instead of 5000, maybe it's 500, but they can still survive economically because there's there's true uh, cost accounting in the food system. Somebody you should really talk to where you live is mm -hmm. um, Patrick Holden of the Sustainable Food Trust, who is a livestock farmer himself and 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 makes a lot of uh, what I hear is wonderful cheese. So, <laughs> he, you know, he he's an expert in true cost accounting. And what that actually means is is being able to um, you know, really value food in a different way and place a true cost on it. So the reason that meat is cheap right now, as I said, is because it's it's subsidized, especially here in the United yes. States and other parts of the world. Yes. It's it depends on on really cheap fossil fuels that that might change, but it, we're not paying the true cost of it. We're not paying the health costs. You know, um, meat has been found by uh, some types of meat have been found by the the World Health Organization to be a uh, cancer car causing or carcinogenic. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're not paying the the pollution costs. We're not paying all of the other costs that really go into making modern meat. But if we if we did it, you know, if we did it a different way and we're really accounted for those those costs, then cheap meat wouldn't really be cheap at all. Mm -hmm. So I, I think, I you know, where farmers fit is we have to find a way for them to continue doing their jobs, doing them well. Farmers are the smartest people I've met in the world, mm -hmm. right? They know more about how to steward land and, and, and take care of animals than anyone. 
but they they need to make money just like all business people and i think sometimes that gets lost in these conversations we blame farmers for destroying the environment we blame them for raising um what a lot of people consider unsustainable meat we need to really shift the blame to those subsidies to government policies that aren't working and maybe a little bit to ourselves yeah of course we, we haven't been making you know, responsible choices as consumers, so much onus is placed on consumers to make all of these choices. And sometimes it's just easier, you know, to go to buy a fast food yeah. um, burger because you, that's what you can afford and that's what'll fill up your family for the night. And that that's a nice segue actually to what is on offer now. So where you would normally go to, I don't know, McDonald's or Burger King to buy your, your dinner for your family uh, once a week, you know, not, not excessively, but you will, it'll be considered a treat. And now there's the plant-based options out there. I mean, I thought that this is kind of where it started for me back in December when I decided to stop eating meat was all of this plurifer, plurifer, I can't say it, proliferation of um, plant-based uh, food that was out there and was really excited by it because I could actually have a and I sound really, I feel really stupid saying it, but I, I'm just being honest. I was excited by the idea of a burger and a sausage and, you know, but it not being an animal. And um, right. so I kind of went that direction. And then the more I've researched this, the more people are saying, well, you know, it's not, it's not that good for you, you know, and you need to be aware of it. And, and like I said to you before, the, this idea that it's not a silver bullet. I mean, I didn't, I didn't start eating it because it, it was, it was saving the environment. I actually didn't know up until recently the impact that um, livestock farming had on the environment to, to, mm -hmm. to what scale it, 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 it had an impact. Um, but what do you, what do you feel about um, the, the, the peripheral, I'm just going to give up saying no, this now. Yeah, this, this rampant <laughs> rise of plant-based foods, <laughs> rampant rise, proliferation, rampant rise, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, I think it was interesting during the pandemic when meat prices did go up for a while mm. that more and more people were buying beyond meat here in the United States, probably buying right. more corn, yeah. Is, it, is that how I pronounce it in, yeah, yeah. in, in England yeah, or buying yeah. the impossible burger or it's now available at some fast food chains? What bothers me, you know, and I know um, the founder of, of a couple of these companies, what bothers me is that they um, they're marketed towards people. OK, let me let me backtrack a little bit. One thing that excites me about them is that they might encourage people who would eat meat or like a burger every day because it's quick for lunch or whatever. Mm it can help them, you know, eat less meat. So that, that's, that's a positive, a right? They're, they're picking an alternative. But what bothers me is that they're, they're probably not healthier. We don't really know um, one of these companies that will shall rename, shall re rename, uh, sorry, <laughs> shall remain nameless, um, has been uh, under lawsuits because they haven't been um, revealing uh -huh. all of their ingredients and nutrition facts, right? right? And they, they've made claims about protein that aren't entirely true. And so I think the problem with them is that they're ultra processed. I don't want anyone to be eating ultra processed mm. food, no matter how cheap it is. Mm. I think that's bad for human health and planetary health. Mm. Um, the more that we can focus on whole foods, and it's not that I, you know, I'm perfect. Sometimes I, you know, eat ultra processed foods like we all do. Like if you're you know, at the airport, or if it's, you know, you're craving something, but having these as part of your staple diet, I don't think is, is the right choice. You would do being vegetarian or vegan, you would be better off eating whole grains and, whole, you know, things like beans and legumes and, and, you know, making um, foods that are, that are really delicious and nutritious, but don't have all the, you know, sodium and, um, fat and and yeah. and everything else so that's yeah. the the issue i have with these they can be sort of that transition food for people yeah. who are you know eating a, a lot of meat but I, again i think they should be eaten in moderation i think personally i think that um plant-based food is a little bit like smokers moving on to vaping it's, it's <laughs> it is it's a similar sort of thing isn't it really because it's it's not good for you but it's a hell of a lot better for you than than the real thing if you like um and it can transition you off and just wean you off entirely so um, yeah, I, I, I was surprised. I thought that um, I thought plant based was the way, but then you know, I'm gonna I'm probably gonna interview somebody that actually manufactures the the food and, and get some that's great intel on them. Well, one um, thing I would say is, that I'm excited about is that over the last few years, we've seen a lot of chefs, very famous chefs, mm. like fine chefs, use meat more as a condiment, not at the center of the plate. 
And I wish we could all think of meat as something that like adds flavoring, that is mm -hmm. used for special occasions, that, you know, is, is not the center of your meal, that we're, you know, gr whole grains and, 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 you know, delicious vegetables that we've sort of ignored for a long time, yeah. take that yeah. center role. And I think that will produce healthier diets. We'll also be, I think, you know, if we're looking at the economics and what will happen over the next few years because of the war ag against Ukraine, we're going to see a lot of of instability and higher food prices, we're already seeing them. And mm -hmm. if we can shift to, you know, less meat using it differently, then I think we'll make a lot of headway, not just in, in you know, uh, economically, but also helping curb the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, um, in animals, particularly from factory farms, produce a lot of methane, they're contributing to, to climate change. You know, all of those inputs that I talked about earlier that go into sort of making modern meat, they contribute to climate change. If we can figure out a way to, to you know, grow, um, to, to raise animals in a different way, they can actually help sequester carbon. Um, there's a lot of research going on for how, you know, exactly. if, if grasslands are managed, managed holistically, if they're managed in a way that can really sink that carbon into soils, then they can be part of the climate solution. I mean, I, I want to say something quite controversial to you, which I haven't really shared with many people, but I think I think you're the right person to, to, to say it to, but part of this journey that I've been on since since December, um, one of the things that I kept kept nagging me was, and, and I won't get any support from the vegetarian, the vegan society on this, but, you know, if you look at, um, if you walk past a field that is full of sheep or cows, they are at that time when you're walking past them living quite an idyllic life. Um, they're relaxing, they're grazing, they're ten, look, looking after their children and all that kind of stuff. Um, and it's only up, up until the point where they're um, where they where they're slaughtered that um, it obviously takes a, a a seriously bad turn for them. But the thing that, that keeps reminding me of that is no different than how we live our lives too, except we know it's coming. <laughs> Bear with me. <laughs> I am, I am, I am. Um, and if we didn't if we didn't know it was coming, and it happened, which I suppose we do, we don't, we know it's coming, but we don't know when. Um, if it's done in a way that it's immediate and without pain, I don't like the word humane because I think I think that's a that's a word that suits a lot of people. And actually, when you look at the the videos on on YouTube, which you know I wouldn't recommend, but I would recommend is that you know uh, um, even even away from the factory farms, just abattoirs themselves. You know the the fact that pigs are gassed first, which is horrendous, obviously, um, and then they're you know. Um, they're stabbed in the neck to drain whilst sometimes while still alive. Same thing with, with you know, when um, chickens are dipped into electrified water and they're still alive sometimes. I mean, that part, you know, if it's going to continue, I do strongly think that has to stop almost immediately. If, if we had a button we could press to, to do that, because no, no sentient being should ever have to, to go through that, you know. I agree. Oh. Suffering is a big part of this, you know, and it's we, we've talked about, you know, how communities suffer. We've mm. talked about how farmers are suffering. Animals, if, if, if they are not killed in a way that respects the, them, you know, giving mm. their lives so that we can all be nourished, then that is, I, I consider, a travesty. Many indigenous cultures have have slaughtered animals for millennia in a way that is sacred and respects mm. the life of the animals uh mm. and and i think that is something that we have forgotten in modern mm. society and you're absolutely right you know th these these videos i you know i've been unfortunately or fortunately i've been to more slaughterhouses and processing plants than i care to yeah. take care to to think about anymore it was part of my research i felt like i had to see them it is a it's um you can tell when animals are scared, just as humans would be, but there are better ways to do their, the, to, to, to make sure that animals die in a respectful way. And, you know, Temple Grandin is an animal, animal uh, behaviorist here in the United States who, is, who works with abattoirs or slaughterhouses, as we call them here in the United States, right. to make sure that the process of, you know, animals like leaving the truck and getting into where they, they eventually die is one that is respectful, where it's calming, where they they don't know it's coming, right? Mm -hmm. They they just think they're they're following the 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 animal in front of them. There are different ways that we can do mm -hmm. this. We can be more respectful of of life in general. And that includes everyone 
along the the animal food supply chain from mm. the farmer to the yeah. consumer to the communities around it and ultimately the animal mm. no I, I i think that the only the thing about the the respectful nature of it which is quite utopian and, and lovely is that on the scale that meat is produced now that's never going to be achievable but well, I am. I know, what is it for me to say? But it feels like it would never be achievable because of the scale of it. But if it, if it was reduced down considerably, then maybe that would be something that would be possible. Absolutely, not a very popular think, viewpoint, but it, you know. No, I, I think processing plants could do better. What happens is the speed at which animals are are slaughtered is so intense. It's intense for the people who work there. It's intense for mm -hmm. the animals. If those slaughter lines could be slowed down and, you know, again, build in that, that I, I, you don't like the word humane, but build in that welfare component. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not just for the animals, it's for the people who work in the, in these, no, these absolutely. processing plants. Absolutely. It's one of the most difficult jobs in the world. It must be very difficult to go home every night after you know seeing so much death around you and you want to make it good for for those employees and and workers as well as the animals themselves i mean i, I suppose i can kind of i can <laughs> i can kind of hear vegetarians or vegans going well just don't eat them then just don't eat them then it, that would be the simple thing there's no stress for the people there's no stress for the animals um there's wider questions then about what happens to the animals which i talked to richard um McRain from the vegetarian society which kind of seem to be ticked really as, as, as to what would happen. There should be less of them and it would be an, ev an evolved process until they were just, you know, back in the wild and that kind of stuff. But um, but the, one of the things that, and I think it was something that Lassie said, Lass, Lassie said, um, was that uh, animal livestock on the land is, a, is an important part of the, the cycle and, and it, to get rid of I mean, nothing's going to ever happen overnight because I don't think humans have ever demonstrated anything that, you know, uh, of that scale anyway. But, um, you know, I guess what what place do livestock animals play in? in I, I think people need, would like to hear that if you if you could talk about that. Sure. I mean, I think one of the most important ways, and especially right now as fertilizer, artificial fertilizer prices go up, is that you know manure is this really valuable resource unless it's you know produced in such mass quantities that it can't be used right and so manure you know livestock that are grazing outside or that are raised outside including pigs and chickens manure can you know help um uh, uh fertilize the land and you know what you need though is good management you don't want all that manure in one place animals need to be moved around and they you know and they um, aerate the soil they make it more stable they make it uh, more nutrient dense, mm -hmm. you know, they can uh, increase um, biodiversity if animals are, are raised the right way, have more birds and, and mm -hmm. um, beneficial insects and, and, and those kinds of things. So grazing when it's done well, when it's not, you know, destructive can be this really beneficial resource and again, helps sequester carbon in soils. And so we can't, you know, I, do, I don't want a world where there's not you know, livestock. I, I think it's part of, uh, as as I said at the beginning, part of 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 what I consider sustainable um, uh, uh, agriculture systems, food and agriculture systems, because we need those animals um, mm. to to produce that that fertility. Um, what I do not want in the you know for the long term is these huge industrial animal factories that are not producing you know really delicious things anyway. You know, they're they're creating a lot of havoc, um, both for the environment and for human health. Yeah. And, you know, again, that that welfare component. So I, I think, you know, when we look at animals as part of a landscape, an agricultural landscape, and holistically, they can be really beneficial. Mm. No, I, I, I kind of I'm coming, I'm coming into that direction, really, and seeing it has been, it's a, I think when you watch um, interviews with other people, and they say something like, you know, a, a remark about it's better for the environment, but then they don't flesh it out. You go, well, you need you're trying to gather all that kind of information, really. Um, so that that's really helped. I mean, what? How long have we got? Are we doing on time? Are we okay for? Well, we're only on an yeah, hour. We're fine, now. We're fine. Yeah. Um. Thank you. Um. Just, what are your thoughts on the on on cellular cellular agriculture? And you know, have you tried meat that isn't hasn't come from an animal? And, and eating it. 
I have not tried cultivated meat. I have. I think it's interesting. I, I. You have to remember that I'm a nerd, right? I'm an agricultural nerd. I think technology and agriculture. Even someone who like me, who you know, is a sustainable agriculture advocate in a lot of ways. I think that there are ways to combine high and low technologies. And what I would like to see is, you know, farmers being involved in the cultivated meat process. I think you can have sustainable livestock farming along with cultivated meat. I think there are lots of tools in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. I think farmers could be part of, of what's needed to grow to, to, to make cultivated meat. You need this infrastructure, right? Mm -hmm. And it's often um, corn or soy and farmers can be part of that and growing it in a responsible way. So I think as long as farmers are part of the conversation, um, and that there's like a lot of participatory research and development of, of cultivated meats as well as other technologies in our food system, um, then we we can, you know, have something that's, you know, a, again, beneficial, that it can be a tool, but it's not a silver bullet. And it's not going to be either we eat cultivated meat or either we eat, you know, um, real meat or, or whatever you want to call it or yeah, we don't yeah. eat you know the, the, that's not going to be the way the world works it's just going to be another option mm -hmm. that that has some benefits to it probably some big costs too just as animal agriculture does no matter how it's done but i i do think it's it's a, a tool in the toolbox that has potential you know maybe enormous potential mm -hmm. to reduce the suffering that we talked about before yeah. and to yeah. help farmers go through that just transition that they need to be um, you know, to, to get to get out of that vicious cycle of factory farming. I've got one more. Well, I've, I've got loads of questions for you, actually, but what, one more. Um, why? I mean, one of the things that um, struck me when um, I think I, I don't know who I talked to first, but just the, the, the penny dropping on um, the fact that uh, livestock farming at the scale it's at, at the moment isn't sustainable and it is incredibly harmful to the environment, way more harmful than all of the things that we were led to believe were the, you know, the kind of the top three things that you should, you know, be calming down on reducing. Why do you, why do you think it's, it's taken, and even now, I mean, I'm, I, I share an office with people, if I said to them, look, you know, it's, it's eating meat um, is actually really harmful to the environment and they would all be surprised and I, I know I'm probably in a small town in England and maybe the information hasn't filtered down to us yet um, but but it does seem like people are still quite surprised by that I mean what what do you think that's about really why do you think it's taken so long for the uh, message to get across a it's, couple, not a new, it's not a new thing is it really no. it's always been bad a couple of things I think about that one that people like me have not done their job well enough to create awareness around the environmental impacts of industrial meat production right. um, that we've we've um, tended to to sort of demonize all meat and mm -hmm. and and I think that's a problem. And then the other thing food is such a personal issue for people mm, people have memories. Sense of like eating ham at Christmas or eating goose at Christmas or whatever, you know, you eat for, for, for particular holidays. It's very visceral how people respond to that. Like sure, people yeah. do not want to be blamed for destroying the environment because of what they eat. Mm -hmm. So we have to turn this around and into, you know, instead of, you, you, you know, you're missing out on meat, you're gaining more by mm -hmm. eating more vegetables. And then you're, you're saving meat for those special occasions. I think we have to sort of flip you know, our, our PR campaigns on this, to be quite honest, and, and make people feel like they're getting something out of it and that they feel good because they're making choices that not only affect their own health, but the health of the environment. Yeah. And, and I, you know, I think anybody in your small town or in your work, your shared workspace, everyone, nobody wants to harm the environment. Nobody right. wants to harm their own health. And if we can sort of, you know, sort of shift the paradigm, shift how we talk about these things so people feel part of the solution instead of being demonized, mm. then I think we can come a long way. I think, I think there's something quite compelling about and not telling people not to do something as well. Um, <laughs> exactly. And, and, and um, you know, I was thinking about the, the, the smoking analogy this morning of um, the phraseology of, I'm not, you know, give up smoking, you know, stop smoking. Um, and when that's twisted to a more positive message, it's a lot easier. I think we're quite basic as humans with messaging and language. Yeah. Um, that, that telling people to stop eating meat because it harms the environment isn't, even though it's, it's well-intentioned, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't particularly um, hit the spot. So um, I think... I think, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it's entirely down to you and the food tank that the whole world doesn't know this. 
Um, I think I think it's the job of everyone. And, and as soon as you know, I know I'll tell, and we, we just exponentially grow the message as fast as possible, really. Because I what what I feel is that it is going to be a gradual ev evolution uh, over time, and it's not going to be the switching off of one thing and turning on of the other. It's going to be a broad mix as in, in a toolkit, as you say. And you know, I'm just I'm just really pleased I can be part of that uh, that journey, really. And I'm I'm really grateful that you were able to sit and talk to me about it because. You know, you've been doing this a long time, you know, um, and, and starting from starting from, you know, the welfare of women, which is a is a is a good thing to be doing, too. So thank you. Thank you. No, <laughs> what an opportunity. And I, I know you're going to reach a lot of different kinds of listeners. And that's mm. that's what we need with this. We need more people it, it, preaching to the choir doesn't get us anywhere, as you no. well know. So thank no. you for putting this together. And, and thank you for including me in Food Tank. Um, a pleasure thank you and that, that uh, festival sounds amazing as well so i'll be i'll be oh please keep in touch yeah that. yeah thank you and in in the, if i do have any other questions in the future oh, please if i can if i could ask you that'd be brilliant as well because it's invaluable you, you're touching so many different areas i wasn't even you know i wasn't even on my radar so but i, I need to keep keep focused on on the on the meat side for now because i think i'll lose everybody if i start diving into other areas so um yeah, but well, bless you though, and, and um, oh, you too, and good luck. Doing. I can't wait to see what comes out of it. Thanks so much. <laughs> All right, bye. Bye.